We're in Luke chapter 15 this morning, and uh, I was praying over this message, and I thought, you know, it's, it's, uh, I had forgotten that we did a whole series in Luke chapter 15 uh, to start the year off about the heart of the Father. We talked about the prodigal son. And uh, as I got back into this again, God had led me to this scripture for today. And as I got back into it again, I remembered that we were in Luke 15 for about six weeks already this year. And I said, Lord, here we are, week number seven in Luke 15. And the Lord just dealt my heart. Luke 15 is the home of lost things in the Bible. Luke 15 talks about things that are lost that God is searching for to find. There is the lost sheep that we're going to talk about today. There is a woman who lost a coin that she went and searched for. And then there's a son who was lost. And I just thought about it and prayed about it. And I said, Lord, why is it again for the seventh week now, Upward Christian Fellowship, we're in Luke chapter 15. And the Lord spoke really clear to my my heart, and I don't say that lightly. He spoke really clearly to my heart and said, I'm preparing the ground Now, I want you to receive this this morning because you've got to get it. It can't just be for me. It's got to be us. He said, I'm preparing the ground to send lost people to upward uh, like you've never seen before. He said he's preparing ground for lost people to come. And he really wants to create here. And it's in process and it's happening. But God wants this to be a safe place for people with all kinds of problems to come and find Jesus find love, find healing, find eternal life, and just be released into their destinies. Will anybody just believe with me for, for this place, this congregation, this fellowship to be a place where lost sheep can find Jesus? Amen. How many would you be willing to say, I want to be a part of a church like that? Amen. How many would you would say, God, I welcome what you're doing in that uh, realm to Upper Christian Fellowship and into my life? Because it's going to be disruptive for you, too, because they're going to come get your seats. <laughs> they're going to park in your parking places. They're not going to be dressed just like you think they should. Some of them aren't going to smell just like you think they should or any of us think they should. Uh, some of them are going to have struggles that may shock some. Well, they won't shock us because we've all been there at some point or another. Some of them are going to be messy, but we welcome them, right? We welcome them. I, I think we ought to just pray right now and just say that to the Lord today. Father, today we welcome what you're doing in this body, in all our lives together. We welcome that, God. You're speaking to us again and again about things that are lost And God, we recognize a pattern here. We recognize that you're talking to this place, this fellowship right here. And you're saying to us, I want to be a place where lost sheep can be found. You're saying to us this morning that you have a number of people who are seeking your heart. Many of them don't even know it yet, but they're looking for a place like this. And God, you're going to entrust us with those people coming here. And Father, we just open our hearts today to say welcome to you. Welcome to what you're doing. Welcome to the harvest that you're sending our way. And by your grace, we'll be faithful to serve you with those you send to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Today, we're going to talk about the Good Shepherd. And, and it is the, the iconic picture of Jesus Christ. If you search Jesus uh, and you look at Jesus' pictures, almost invariably, you will see sheep around him. We think about Jesus like that. He's, you know, he's light skinned with light brown hair and a, and a beard, and he's got a sheep under each arm. You know what I mean? We just think about Jesus as his shepherd. And that is a very powerful image, especially considering that he never was a shepherd during his earthly ministry. That may shock you if you're uh, not that advanced in biblical knowledge, but Jesus was a carpenter. In fact, many people think, some scholars, a a sizable number of scholars believe that Jesus wasn't a carpenter with wood, that he was actually a stonemason. There are a number of people that believe that to be true, and there's some evidence in Scripture, if you read between the lines, that he could have been a stonemason, but he built things. He was not a shepherd at all. But this picture of Jesus uh, just really uh, sticks with us because in a very real and a very spiritual sense, he was a shepherd. And, and he told this parable, and, and I think it's important for us to look at this parable. And if you've been in church a long time, this story is very familiar. But sometimes we miss 
why he told this story. We miss the reason behind it. We miss the the context in which he told this story. So we're going to go through this passage and just kind of sweep through it this morning. And I'm going to point out some gems in this passage for you and I that we can take and live in our lives. So so let's just look at it. Luke chapter 15. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. And the, the first two verses really set us up with the context in which Jesus told this story and kind of tell us the reasons that he told this. Now here's what it says. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to Jesus, often came to listen to Jesus teach. Now I find that just a little bit funny. IRS agents and other notorious sinners... (laughs) It's like the Bible just assumes these people are evil. I mean... The Bible, if you're a tax collector, I don't mean to beat you up this morning. If you work for the IRS, a lady told me the other day she got a call supposedly from the IRS and and, and she answered it and they told her she had to send money right away. Well, she called the real IRS and they comforted her. They said, we will never call you. But then they said something else. They said, we will come to your house instead. (laughs) I don't know if that's comforting or not. She'd been listening to a scam, but it says straight up, tax collectors and other notorious sinners. It says that because in that culture, in that day, the tax collectors were very crooked and deceitful, and they were known to steal from the people. They would charge you more than you actually owed and put the balance in their pocket and send whatever they had to send on to Rome. And so they were known as very, they were looked upon as sinners. So it's saying here, and this just flew in the face of the people there, but tax collectors and notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. I want you to hear this. Sinners are attracted to Jesus. Sinners are attracted to Jesus. You cannot dispute that fact. Wherever he went, sinners came. And I want to tell you this, the more that the church is filled with the Spirit of Christ, the more lost people will show up to hear what Jesus has to say. I want you to understand that. We talk about churches being Spirit-filled. One of the greatest evidences of a church being filled with the Holy Spirit is that lost people are coming in there to hear what's being said. I got one amen out of all that. I worked really hard for that one amen. The more full our church is of the Holy Spirit, the more full it will be with people who are far from God. Amen. Amen. You're working with me now. If our churches are not attracting lost people, we have a really difficult idea to deal with here that maybe we're not as full of Jesus as we thought we were. Maybe we're filled with cultural Christianity instead of Jesus. Maybe we're filled with regional Christianity or religious Christianity more than we are Jesus. Because when you get filled with Jesus, sinners are going to be attracted to you. The word here is not the best translation. It it says in in verse 2, This made the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law complain. He was associating with sinners. It talks about him welcoming sinners. But the word here in verse 1 is not translated so well. It says, Notorious sinners came to listen to Jesus teach. The word in the Greek is draw near. It literally means there was an attraction Jesus had for them, a curiosity. Jesus drew them in. They were were just magnetized to Jesus Christ. And oh, I pray that Upward Christian Fellowship can be so filled with the presence of Jesus that they don't come because we have nice lights and a nice building and all friendly faces, but they come because there's life here and they've got to get a hold of the life and it's speaking to them saying, this is what you're looking for, this is what you've been searching for, and they come here and find Jesus. They drew near to Jesus I found this out about Jesus. He's always drawing in the outsider. Have you ever felt like an outsider? I'd love it if all you outsiders would just be honest with me for a minute and be, just be very honest and tell me, how many in this building have ever just felt like you didn't really belong? You just didn't quite fit in. 
You felt like you were on the outside looking in. You weren't part of the club. For whatever reason, you just felt like they're there and, and I'm out here. I want you to understand Jesus comes with a heart for you and for me, the outsider. Amen. So the notorious sinners and tax collectors are drawn to Jesus. Then verse 2, here's, here's really important, something for you to get a hold of. This is the religious people. This made the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law, the insiders, those who claimed to know God, those who claimed to be spiritual, those who claimed to know when the Messiah was coming, those who claimed to be close to the heart of God, when the sinners came, they complained. They complained that he was associating with such sinful people. Now, the word here means to, it's a very powerful word. It doesn't mean he was just hanging out with them. The word in the Greek means waiting for, welcome, and receive. If you're an outsider here today, Jesus has been waiting for you. That makes me want to shout. If you're feeling on the fringe, if you're feeling left out, if you're feeling like you don't belong, he's been waiting for you so that he could welcome you to his family and receive you to himself. Pharisees complained about this. It's always, it's always bugged me when people who called themselves Christians couldn't rejoice over other people's lives being changed. Right? Because it disrupted them. But that's what was going on with the Pharisees, the false spiritual crowd, the false religious crowd, the people who claimed to be good church-going people but really didn't have the heart of Jesus. And there's a lot of people out there like it today, right? There's a lot of people today who name the name of the Father, but they don't have the heart of the Father. As we said earlier in Luke 15, the, the prodigal son, you can live in the Father's house and somehow miss the Father's heart. You can sit in church and not really have the heart of Father God. Amen? We've, we've seen some tragic suicides over the last couple weeks. Celebrity suicides, right? Isn't that a terrible tragedy? And the heart of the Christian should be contrite and broken and prayerful and, and lifting up families and saying, God, comfort that family. Help us to learn from this tragedy. And, and even pray for that individual. Yet you see some people on social media that as soon as a celebrity commits suicide, they come in calling themselves Christians and immediately consign that person to hell. And it continually gives the church a black eye. Because when someone dies a tragic death, it's not for us as a church just to come in and weigh in on their eternal destiny and get judgmental, arrogant, and self-righteous about it. It's for us to humble ourselves and say, God, help me to help the next one who's struggling with that. Help me to reach out to this family. Help some way this tragedy to turn into a redemptive story for somebody else. But sometimes... Pharisees and religious people are more concerned about protecting their own image and bolstering their own self-confidence rather than reaching people for Jesus. We'll let that soak just for a minute. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've been a mess in my life. I've had some real struggles in my life. I have nothing of myself that I can point to somebody else and say they're not as good as I am. I need Jesus as much as the lowest person in the world needs Jesus. Amen? So I never can get to a position of complaining when he associates with somebody else. I need to rejoice that he associated with me. Amen? So Jesus associated with sinners, and it said this, even eating with them. He would even sit down to eat with them. Had a guy challenge me on this one time. He said, well, doesn't the Apostle Paul talk about how we shouldn't eat with sinners? There's a scripture about that, but if you read that scripture carefully, it doesn't say don't eat with a sinner. It says don't eat with a person who claims to be a Christian and is living the life of a sinner in secret. Can anybody say, ouch? 
we're all the time to be reaching out to sinners. So that's the context of this whole story that's told. You have a tension between the insiders and the outsiders. You got the people who feel like they're on the fringes and all the people who are supposedly in the club are, are, are upset that Jesus is associating and even eating with these people. So that whole context and then verse 10 says, so Jesus told them this story. Because of this tension, because of this pull from inside to outside, this resistance from those in the club to welcome the outsiders Jesus started with this story. And here's what he said. He said, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Now he's appealing to them. In, in, in other translations, it says, if any of you, he's appealing to their common sensibilities and saying, any one of you men in the crowd, if you have a hundred sheep and one of them gets outside of the fold, you're going to leave the 99 in the fold, the ones that are already saved, the ones that are already protected. You're going to get outside of the walls. You're going to step out and go chase down that outsider, that lost one, and you're going to bring him back. Any one of you is going to do that. I love it. He appealed to them and said, our priority must be Reaching those who are lost. Now, i got some news for you. We're compared to sheep. Sheep are, are not very smart. They wander. They easily go astray. They're like us. That's the Bible picture of us, one of them anyway. We easily wander. What the Good Shepherd says is any time that, that there is one outsider... We're going to leave the insider safe in the fold and go to find that one that is lost. I'm going to tell you, losing something refocuses your priority really quickly. We once were at the Biltmore House. My wife and I and were standing out in the, uh, in the uh, if you've been to the Biltmore House, there's a little area where there's the bakery and then there's a sandwich shop. I, I, everything's relative to where the food is in my life, right? It's, I know where the bakery is. You get the chocolate over here and the sandwiches over here. Then there's a stable cafe right in here. You know that little courtyard there? If you've been to the Biltmore House, we're standing there with our children. And our, and our keyboardist this morning was standing there beside me, but she was about this high. And we just put her down. And I don't know about your children, but uh, my little girl would wonder. If you put her down, she was gone. Any of you had a child like that? If you turned them loose, they would walk away without even looking back. Now, my son was more, he was concerned with staying with us. He never did wander off very much. But my little girl, she's just gone. So we sat her down, and then uh, my wife went to the restroom, and I assumed that Daniela had gone with her, and she assumed Daniela had stayed with me. So I look around, Daniela's gone, and I thought, hmm, I'm sure she went with Alexa. And I started thinking, I want to make sure she went with Alexa. So I walked down to the restroom. Here comes Alexa by herself. Where's Daniela? I thought you had her. Any of you ever done that before? I thought you had her. How many have done that? It would make me feel better to see lots of hands here this morning. <laughs> if that happened to you and you didn't raise your hand, you just don't care about me. <laughs> I'm glad to see other people have done it. We panicked. Immediately, our priorities were refocused. We didn't care about anything at the Biltmore House. We didn't care about having a sandwich. We didn't care about seeing the beautiful dining room and the library that we love to go see. The gardens meant nothing. Our, the ticket price meant nothing. Nothing meant nothing but finding our little girl who was lost. Only, it only lasted about two minutes and I heard a security guard saying, we have a baby, we have a baby. I, Where? That's my baby. <laughs> and then they hand you your baby back and you feel like the worst parent in the whole <laughs> world. Some of them are nice and some of them look at you like, how could you lose this precious baby? Sheep are like that. And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, there's an old hymn that says, uh, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. 
prone to leave the God I love. We are prone like sheep to wander. A sheep will wander off from the shepherd. If you've got sheep in a sheepfold, I read a little bit about sheep in preparation for this message. If you've got sheep in a sheepfold, if they find one exit hole in the hedge, they will walk through it every time. If they find a way to get in trouble, they'll take it. True story. Here's what happened with sheep too. They'll follow each other right out of the fold. One won't go by themselves. They'll take three with them. And once they get out of that fold, they have no idea how to get back. They are helpless. They're hopeless. Except for the shepherd. Except for the shepherd. The shepherd will do what? He will step outside the fold because Jesus pursues outsider. Jesus pursues outsiders. There's something significant about Jesus. He was, he went, you may not realize this, but he went outside the city of Jerusalem to be crucified. They took him outside. He laid his life down outside. And I don't know the full story, but I think there's some significance to the fact that he went outside the city because he's declaring with his life that he stepped outside of the safety. He went outside of those who were found, and he reached out to the outsiders just like you and just like me. Amen. Amen. When you felt like you didn't belong, when you felt like you were lost, when you had wandered from home, maybe you've never even been at home. Maybe your life has been spent from the outside looking in, trying to figure out where you fit in. I'm going to tell you something. The devil is a master at trying to push us to the outside. Amen. If you're sitting here and you're struggling with something deep and dark, how many are struggling this morning with something so deep and so dark you don't want to tell? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. That wouldn't work at all. But some of you right here today, I promise you, you're struggling with something so deep and so dark that you would be so ashamed if anybody found out about it. And it's eating you up inside. And it's continuing to push you outside. You really didn't even feel like you should come here this morning. Because you thought, here, I've got this problem. I don't really deserve to be here. We're leading worship this morning, singing up here, and they're they're singing, I'm a child of God. And you really want to sing that, but something inside of you is telling you you don't deserve to sing that because of what you're struggling with. The enemy's keeping, trying to keep pushing you outside. But remember, Jesus receives sinners. Can I get an amen? amen? That means you. You say, even with my, yes, even while I'm still struggling, yes, even if I'm still battling this thing, yes, Jesus eats with sinners. He will sit down and eat with you and have a conversation with you. I love it because he's trying to reach Those who are on the fringes. You're sitting here this morning with your struggle, and the heart of Jesus is going out to you saying, Come on in. Come on in. Come on into the sheepfold. Come on into the family. Come on in and find life. Amen. He's the good shepherd. He goes outside, and I love it. Some of you think, Well, he'll give up on me soon. Verse 4 says, He will go to search for the one that is lost. Listen, folks, this is not hard. There's a big old screen right behind me. I'm giving a test and the answers are on the board. He will search for the one that is lost. You're good. You're good. Give yourself a big hand. You got it. That word until is powerful. In the Greek, it means until a definite period of time. It means that this action will continue 
till something is accomplished. And the shepherd says, I will search for that outsider, that lost sheep, until they are found. How long are you going to pray? Until. How long are you going to love your husband or wife? Until. Until they do that one. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, as long as it takes, as long as it takes, he'll be searching for you. He'll be searching for you. Even in the fold, the enemy wants us to push us to the fringe of the sheepfold. Some of you come to church and you don't feel like you really fit in here at Upward Christian Fellowship. You just feel like you're here and everybody already has their friends and you don't quite fit in. It's true, a lot of times in church. Let me just tell you something. You've got to make some effort. I said, you've got to make some effort. If you're an outsider and you see yourself as an outsider, you tend to act like an outsider. Can I get an amen? Amen. If you think nobody in this place loves you, you'll stand back and act like nobody loves you, and none of the rest of us really know what to do with you. <laughs> We're not really sure if you want us to speak to you or not. I found this to be the case. A lot of times people come to church, and, and it's because they're hurt. It's because they're struggling. But they'll sit back like this, and they're telegraphing to everybody, don't speak to me. And they're the very ones that will leave and say, that church is not friendly. <laughs> Am I wrong? If you're on the fringe, if you've been hurt, let me tell you, church is the best place in the world to get hurt. Because it's a safe place to get hurt. You with me? Sometimes we only grow through getting hurt. If you're on the fringe, in the sheepfold, you need to plug on in. You need to get a little closer. You need to find some friends. You need to get in. Get in the middle. Safest place in the world is right in the middle of the sheepfold. Right. Right. Come on in. Jesus calls the outsiders and says, come into the sheepfold. Then he calls those who are in the church and says, come on in. I love the story in verse 5, and i got to hurry. we got a story we want to show you that's really powerful. But in verse 5, it says, When he's found it, he will joyfully carry it home on its shoulders. It's a picture of a father with a kid on his shoulders. When he's found that sheep, he puts it in a place of intimacy, and he personally carries you home. Oh, I just love that. I could just preach on this all day. If you'd give me all day, I would. Verse 7, I'm going to skip ahead. It says, in the same way, I want you to hear me, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have it straight away. I'm going to give you another test. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over... I want you to just stop right there with that word right there. There is more joy in heaven over... One... One. He's the savior of the one. How many of you like M&M's? How many like M&M's? If I can't get you to raise your hand on that, I, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to win. How many of you have eaten an M&M ever? <laughs> I'm just trying. I'm trying my best to get some of you just to move a little bit, you know. Let's see if you're still alive. How many of you like M&M's? How many, how many are fanatical about M&M's? I mean, you could eat uh, 10 bags of them if you want to. Let me ask you folks, how many is acceptable to eat at one time? I don't mean at one sitting. I mean, how many can you put in your mouth at one time? What's acceptable? Five? Twenty? I've got right here in a married, one married couple here has gone from five to 20. That's how God brings us together, right? <laughs> five to 20. I just wonder if you'll be honest, is there anybody here that eats them one at a time? Can I see your hand? Raise them up high. I'd like to see all the one at a time. I, I don't get, my wife. 
what is wrong with you? <laughs> She's that way. My wife eats one piece of popcorn at a time. Popcorn was meant to be shoveled in. I go to the movies and I'm like. Oh. <laughs> I was at camp one time where I'm fixing to go uh, this, this uh, afternoon. I'm fixing to go. I'm southern. Yep, you got that. I'm headed there this afternoon. I'm preparing to go. And I saw this little girl at the table and she was eating M&M's one at a time. And I sat down with her because I wanted to minister to her. <laughs> Teach this child something. But I, I said to her, I was cutting up with her a little bit. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm eating M&M's. I said, why are you eating them one at a time? She said, I enjoy every one. <laughs> and as I read this verse, God took me back to that little girl. And God said... I enjoy every one. He's the God of the one. He's the Savior of the one. We're going to look at a story of a young lady that God, a young lady at Upward, that, that I start to say, God, a story of a young lady that the devil tried to push her to the outside of her very own family and tried to destroy her, but Jesus reached her. Let's look at Michelle's story very quick. My name is Michelle Norris, and this is my story. I got saved when I was five years old. I grew up in a Christian home, and I went to a Christian elementary school. And for the most part, I had a happy childhood. And then in the sixth grade, my family moved from the Los Angeles, California area to Meridian, Mississippi. And my life changed dramatically. Um, I was a fish out of water and um, my home life started to change quite a lot. You see, when my sister was growing up in California, she was molested by a family friend. And your brain at that age can't comprehend or deal with what's happening. So she started to take it out on me. And um, she would tell me things like, the family would be so much better off without you and you should just go kill yourself. Well, after years and years and years of this verbal abuse, you start to believe it. And I started to internalize that and I had no self-worth at all. Um, I remember looking back at my graduation you know, um, book and, and looking at it and all of the things, you know, have a great summer, stay sweet. and remembering like thinking that these kids had no idea how much pain I was in. Um, I would go from class to class literally staring at the floor because I assumed nobody wanted to talk to me. And um, I thought about killing myself every single day. And whatever your childhood is, you think is normal. So I thought everybody thought like this. And I had heard somebody say one time, you know, everybody has thoughts of suicide. So I thought this was normal. I didn't realize at the time that what they meant was everybody occasionally has these kinds of thoughts and you know that if you think these thoughts every single day you need to get some help. Um, so my sister, we grew up, my sister graduated or moved out of the house and um, I think life got a little bit better. Then I went to college and I decided that I didn't want to live this lonely life anymore. So I forced myself to look up when I walked and I forced myself to talk to people and life got better. And um, I graduated college and I got married and I had two beautiful boys and I thought all of that was in the past, that was behind me. And then the last couple years of my life happened. Um, my son um, has always been an anxious child and life was pretty okay until about the fourth grade and then it sort of fell apart and so we got him tested in the fifth grade and found out that he has generalized anxiety disorder and he started having more and more meltdowns 
and it was excruciating watching my son go through this and not being able to do anything about it. Um, here I am as a special education teacher and I couldn't help my own son. Um, and it got really, really bad because the only thing I'd ever wanted to do in life was to be a mom. And I was failing and I couldn't do it. And I didn't know how to help him. And um, at the lowest point, I started having these suicidal thoughts again. And then I thought, well, maybe I should just leave my family. And I remember having a date night with my husband and sitting in the car, telling him they'd be better off if I just left. For a while, I had really thought God had made a mistake and that he had given my son the wrong mother and that I couldn't do it. But through counseling, I learned that, in fact, God knew exactly what he was doing because my son needed me as much as I needed him. Um, so life got better um, and then my husband this past year lost his job and we saw an uptick in meltdowns with my son and life was very chaotic and trying to find a, a new job and all of the things that go with that and um, I started having some of those thoughts again and Pastor Andy did a, a sermon series called uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And in that series, he talked about suicide. And he talked about that, you know, nobody else can replace you, that there is only you. And if you're not here, there's something in life that won't be accomplished because you're not here to do it. And um, that really, I told him, I wrote a letter to him and said that that sermon series saved my life because it kept me from spiraling down the rabbit hole um, that life would be better without me. And so um, I just, I really wanna encourage you that um, whoever is around you to um, ask that second question. When you go and say, hey, how are you? And everybody says, I'm fine. Ask them, no, really, how are you? Um, and we're also scared of sharing our story because we're also scared of being judged and what are people going to think? And, you know, she's, I'm a pastor's wife and a teacher and a mom. You're not supposed to have those kind of thoughts. But, but everybody has something that they're struggling with, whether it's this or addiction or whatever. Everybody has something. And the person that you're sharing with is just as messed up as you are because we all we all are messed up and we all need Jesus. And so love each other. You just, you never know, you might save a life today. And that is my story. Let's stand together. Would you stand with me, Jesus? We love you.